Yes. Remember, okay. Twitter is the most important search engine, second most important search engine. So you should be tweeting and following this because hashtag, hashtags will tell you what's going on in the world. So they'll, they'll do CNS Summit and see your stuff, right? Absolutely. Talking with, well, it is true that you are independently verified as the most, the one, number one, you'll say better than me, but number one <laughs> ranked influencer in the whole of healthcare or something? Yeah, I think I'm the tallest midget. You know, I, I, I think that, that it's important. You know, we talked this morning, Sarah talked so eloquently about collaboration is the new competitive advantage. And, and, and Twitter and social media is a conduit through which collaboration flows. Mm -hmm. So for me, I mean, it's, it's, it's extraordinarily important. So I think a lot of people, particularly in life sciences, are like, Twitter? Well, I have nothing to say. Well, interesting. But you have a lot to listen to, especially the chatter that's right. going on here today. So we actually, this is the first year we haven't had our uh, social media camp, which uh, Dr. Next thing right here at the front uh, usually runs for us. So uh, we do try and encourage people for sure. Um, so let's get into, you, you're very good at sort of having views and definitions of things. So what do, let's throw out some words that people talk about all the time. Innovation, transformation, and probably my least favorite, disruption. Ah, I, I um, love disruption. <laughs> what, what do you think of those terms? What, what do they mean to you? So my experience as a marketer, the life science industry is bad at positioning. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they, they're okay at strategic thinking, but oftentimes, Positioning is more of a scientific or clinical bundle of benefits or profile. As clinicians, we're taught that this antibiotic is bum, 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 bum. But as marketers, we need to have that one thing. So, so for me, this innovation is, is a word that is sort of articulated from, down, uh, from high above. The CEO says, well, boy, look, look at Novartis. They've got that. Look at Johnson & Johnson and Jayla. We need to innovate. But it's an abstract concept that has no methodological underpinnings. And this goes back to this morning that you have to have a roadmap. You know, you have to have a destination. So I think that we have to link innovation to tangible outcomes or tangible opportunities. And the other thing, I think a lot of people mistake the I words. They mistake innovation for implementation. It's been said that 70% of the solutions already are out there. Open source innovation is premised by the notion that the innovation is maybe out there. So innovation in of itself is interesting. Now, 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 you know, you get me all agitated when I start talking about innovation. If we told everybody in the room to be 20% more innovated, innovative, that's nonsense, right? It, it, it's meaningless. But Jay Gould, the professor at Harvard, talked about evolution in the context of punctuated equilibrium. He said that nothing happens, nothing happens, nothing happens, then all of a sudden something happens. And I think that innovation is like that because we need to establish the inflection point or the points at which innovation may be best served or most vulnerable. So when we talk about innovation in clinical trials. Well, you know, the, the Xerox machine doesn't have to be more innovative. I don't want to make it 20% faster to make a Xerox copy of something. But I might want to look at patient recruitment and social media. So finding the point at which innovation lives is just as important. Now the other side of that coin is, is the, the proverbial disruptor, right? Everybody says we, need, we want to disrupt the marketplace. We want a company of disruptors. That's nonsense. Imagine a, a 500 person company where everybody's a disruptor. Nothing gets done. It's really the judicious application of disruption. It's the right person. There are innovators. There are implementers and there are disruptors. And it's not the same thing for everybody, except we fall in love with the lexicon of discovery and the lexicon of innovation. And I think that's tragic in a way. So um, I've seen you write about the, the patient's role of this. So do you think the patient should be in the center of all this? Yeah, I, I think pharma's search for patient centricity is nonsense. Tell us all about that. And, and <laughs> look, pharma, is in a precarious time. Their, their, their strange search for patient centricity, I think that they should be patient infused. I think that, that understanding the patient, understanding the journey, understanding the value and, and, the, and the human aspect of this is extraordinarily important. But the domain of the life science industry, I think is in the realm of CRISPR, okay. in immuno oncology, in science. That's where we win. You wanna fight 
in retail medicine, you, you want to fight against Amazon, you lose already. So I think consumer centricity is interesting because what pharma has done, what life science industry has done is they've taken the traditional value ladder. In other words, what they've done is taken feature, benefit, value. So they've taken the drug that has rapid absorption, laddered it up to the benefit, which is rapid pain relief or action. Then they've taken that back to the notion of, I've got my life back. That becomes the value for every single life science company and every product. You know the image. It's the patient with their hand up saying, I've got my life back. It's erectile dysfunction. It's arthritis. It's almost any clinical condition. Now, the interesting thing in the era of competition, where pharma wants to differentiate themselves, they've laddered themselves up to this pablum of undifferentiation. So I don't think the domain of the life science industry is patient centricity per se. It's important. It's absolutely essential. But I think that we've moved away from our core point of differentiation. Pharma and the life science industry is smarter and better than Amazon, than Steve Jobs, than, than Gates, than all the luminaries out on the West Coast. They are. They are smarter when they're in the domain of science and biology. Very interesting and provocative. Um, what do you think about the role of culture and innovation? Well, culture is very interesting. And, and I think that there are two interesting points here. We talk about leadership, right? The bold leadership. I think bold is good. And we have different kinds of leadership models. Most prototypically is the model of, let's say, Elon Musk, yep. right? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna call him the bully model. That's probably not the best word, but it's the bold leader. I will do it. I will buck convention. I will disrupt. And unfortunately, the implementation of that disruption is a function of the culture. And if the people, the rank and file, the people who are doing the actual work, don't embrace that innovation mindset, if they don't understand, don't embrace and don't move forward into that dynamic, it's going to fail. How many of you here have used telemedicine for a health visit? Wow, seven, eight, shame on you. You're gonna go back to your, to your marketing groups and talk about the technological implementation and say we should use all this mumbo jumbo in clinical trials and you're not doing it. So how do you expect to be innovative if the culture doesn't embrace it? So culture squashes innovation. That's a, and that, that's, that's, a, that's a, an academic perspective out of Harvard Business Review. That's not my opinion. But the other interesting thing about this is that there's that Elon Musk bully model, and there's also this model of Nikola Tesla. Those of you who've studied science, Nikola Tesla was an amazingly brilliant man, largely responsible for the implementation of alternating current. He changed the world. We live in the world of the electron. So credit Nikola Tesla for doing that, but Nikola Tesla was a fragile soul. He wasn't a bully. In fact, he was bullied by Thomas Edison, by other innovators, by VC. It's the same story. It's the same story as it is today. So we have to be very careful about the nature of innovation because innovation itself is fragile. And most particularly, it's fragile because it lives in the context of life science. We're not making a driverless car here, guys. We're helping people with cancer. So innovation comes from a variety of stakeholders, like parents, like patients, like engineers. And some of those voices in the context of health and disease and sickness are not bold and big. They're fragile. So I think that's very, very important that, that we watch culture and we watch innovation, because I think that, that it's a little different in the life science industries. So I've uh, heard you use the analogy of lightning and lightning rod. What do you mean by that? Yeah. So everybody wants to be an innovator, right? Everybody wants to be an innovator, a disruptor, all those cool words. I, I think what, what we've learned, particularly from this morning and open innovation, is that innovation happens all over the place. The value of, of that dynamic is that pharma is not necessarily going to be the innovator. Okay? They, they have two of the three stools. Of, of, of innovation, development. They have clinical validation, right? We can do a trial. They have market access. We can get to the physicians, maybe to the consumer, if you look at maybe a J&J &J model, but they're missing the lightning. And what pharma needs to do is not be a bastion of innovation, but be a lightning rod. Be a lightning rod. They have to attract these lone voices of innovation. And, and just putting your flag on your building and say, innovators, welcome here, is very good. That's step one. Being on Twitter, having a, a focal point where you can actually 
connect with innovators is real important. The other thing is you, life science, you're the landing ground. You're the runway that innovators land on. Is it smooth? Is it receptive? Or is it bumpy, convoluted, and problematic? So you have to think about that because innovation is out there. We saw it yesterday, really cool things. The interesting thing is, are you as an organization receptive to that innovation? That's brilliant. Well, John's around all day, too. Tell, tell us your tw Twitter handle again so that they all know. John Nosta, J-O-H-N-N-O-S-T. Guys, listen, Twitter is really interesting. It's a search engine, right? Look at your hashtag. Look up Immuno Oncology. Look up CRISPR. Look up CNS Summit, and you'll find about what people are talking about now. It's a powerful tool, and you should take advantage of it. Thank you, John. Thank Pleasure you, having you. Pleasure. Thank you.